The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. The achievement gap in educational attainment and career advancement is one of the most worrisome social problems that America faces. African American students across the country are trailing their white counterparts in reading and math scores by wide margins. The gap has hardly shrunk despite massive increases in government spending on K-12 education and remedial programs like Head Start. Joining us to discuss what he thinks needs to be done to increase the achievement of low-income and minority students is Georgetown Law Professor Peter Edelman. And now, Doug Besherov. Peter Edelman, welcome back to the University of Maryland and Policy Watch. Thank you. Pleasure to be here with you again. Well, last time we talked about uh, poverty and uh, a little bit what to do about it. I think many people think that education is part of the answer. And you've spent a fair amount of your adult life uh, being worried about youth uh, and their education. Uh, let me start with a job you held many years ago in my home state of New York. You were director of the New York State Division for Youth. When was that and what is the New York State Division for Youth? Uh, that was in the second half of the 70s, from 75 to uh, early 79, Doug, uh, with Governor Hugh Carey, uh, the first Democratic governor at that time since uh, Averill Harriman, uh, some years earlier. And the agency uh, is one that has responsibility for youth corrections in the state, so that it receives from the courts uh, those young people uh, who have engaged either in juvenile delinquency acts that would be a crime if they were an adult, or uh, what are called status offenses, uh, running away from home, and being habitually truant. So not to put too fine a point on it, but you were a jailkeeper. Yes, I was the I was the jailkeeper for young people uh, in, in the state. Most of our facilities, and I changed the mix, uh, were uh, not did not have locks on the doors mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. did not have fences, but we certainly had secure facilities because they're unfortunately uh, are always young people uh, who do things where the community needs to be protected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and their families sometimes, for sure, for sure. So um, you said you tried to change from lock to unlock. What, were, what are your impressions? What did you learn from that period that's colored your subsequent professional life? I've learned how, how difficult that work is. Uh, I've certainly I think I knew then and uh, learned uh, more about how we should be doing everything we can to, uh, present, to prevent young people from, from uh, getting into trouble in the first place, which means... Uh, because once they get in trouble, it's difficult to unwind that problem. It is. Uh, the, the number who uh, get, have further difficulty end up in adult jail is, is way too high. Uh, of course, that's true of the foster care system as well, mm -hmm. uh, children mm -hmm. being taken from their homes because the parenting wasn't, wasn't right. Uh, and a uh, disproportionate number, as you well know, uh, end up uh, in the criminal justice system as well. And we're still fighting the battle uh, in terms of trying to, once we, we do have a uh, young person who gets into trouble, uh, trying to respond to them as still capable of change, uh, still growing, still maturing. Um, and uh, there are a, a few for whom the prognosis is terrible, it's sometimes because they have mental health problems uh, that uh, we don't respond to fully uh, or that it's difficult. But, uh, the vast majority are really uh, still at a phase that if, if we could uh, reach them individually with education and with uh, counseling and help and with a sense of, of opportunity as, as they go on, the ability to get back into the community and be functional, um, that would make a major difference. And we have some examples in the state of Missouri, for example, mm -hmm. they really have a juvenile correctional system. Uh, that uh, deals with uh, the young people as individuals and based on their needs, but not in enough places around the country. Well, I want to talk more about youth, but first, I think we shouldn't leave the impression um, that as young people get older and become hardened criminals, 
uh, that uh, then uh, they, there's no hope for them. For me, one of the most heartwarming, I think, is really uh, 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 experiences is to uh, see programs for prisoner reentry for older men and women who've committed heinous crimes. And they've turned around their lives. I've been to places with people who were convicted of murder and so forth, and they've become, and maybe as they get older and maybe their hormones are, you know, less active, or maybe it was something wonderful about what happened in prison. Uh, uh, but there are thousands, and there are about to be many more, because I think almost a million uh, of felony offenders are going to be released from jail uh, in the next five or eight years. Um, there are many older um, criminals who are leaving the criminal justice system and living productive, non-criminal lives. We should recognize that. Ab absolutely. Uh, we lock up too many people in the first place, over two million people under lock and key uh, in this country. That can't be right. Uh, it can't be necessary to lock up that many people. A lot of this is related to uh, our drug policies as a country and, and the fact that there are many uh, people uh, in jail for possessing drugs. There are many people who perhaps sold drugs but did it to feed a habit and, and where we, we just haven't tackled uh, the, the drug problem from a public health point of view. Uh, I think we do need to uh, put serious drug offenders in jail, uh, but, but within that I think we should respond to people's needs for drug treatment, mental health help, mm -hmm. and then all the rest of it. And so we're just beginning to discover, and of course as a society we better discover it, because 600,000 people a year are getting out uh, of, of prison or jail in this country, so the numbers over five years are even higher than you said. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And if we just say, oh well, it's, it's hopeless, we're, we're going to have a massive problem out on the streets. We already do have too large a problem. Uh, and yes, uh, if we would revise our views and not make it so hard for ex-offenders to, to get reintegrated into the community, to find jobs, uh, and uh, if we made an effort to, to deal with the literacy problems that exist, uh, they're disproportionately uh, in our youth corrections facilities, in our adult correction facilities, people are reading and doing math at, at a very low levels, and it's not that they're not capable of learning if we provide the programs and then on into what's necessary to function in the job market. Mm. You have to have a healthy economy. Right now, people getting out of jail, it's going to be even worse in the middle of this terrible recession. It surely is. It is striking, though, how little attention and how little government money is going to ex-offenders, uh, given the scope of the problem and how much we spent on them while they were in jail. Um, they don't seem to be on the radar scope. Uh, I hope that that's changing, although right for the moment it clashes with our need to, to uh, end this recession and to have recovery policies. Uh, but I do at least uh, see uh, more lip service at the very least and more, more programs uh, around the country, but uh, they are so far from meeting the need. Uh, it just, it's, it's vitally important to, for people to be able to expunge records uh, after a while, for people who you know, uh, very often someone who's been found innocent, who's been charged and found innocent, can't even get that charge expunged, mm -hmm. uh, when in fact the system said they didn't do it. Well, that's a whole st other program, I think. I want to take us back to youth, mm -hmm. uh, or as they say in the movies, youth. Um, and uh, you, together with Harry Holzer and the late Paul Offner, who... Mm -hmm. um, uh, dear friend of mine. Well, I have well. to tell you, I once heard Fidel Castro speak in 1959, and he kept talking about the Jews of America. And I didn't understand until about the fifth time that he was talking about the youth of America. <laughs> that is funny. Anyway, you've written this book uh, with uh, Harry Holter and Paul Offner. It's called Reconnecting Disadvantaged Young Men. What does reconnecting mean? We have too many young people, uh, we were talking about those who actually go to prison, uh, they are a very large uh, tip of an even larger iceberg of young people who end up uh, without a, a high school diploma and also without being in the job market. Uh, and uh, the numbers are not uh, hard census numbers, but between the ages of 16 and 24, maybe three, four million young people, young men and young women, disproportionately African-American, Latino, some obviously arithmetically large number white as right. well. 
who are just really uh, without prospects uh, because they don't have the education they need, they don't have the, the connection that they need. And so they're kind of uh, metaphorically and quite literally out in the streets. Uh, and so we need to figure out, number one, how to keep young people in school, how to, how to make school a How place. do we do that? How do we well, keep Well, I think in? a fundamental thing for uh, lots of young people, and we have evidence for it, uh, is to have much more school to work, uh, much more connection between school and work it is to have things like career academies that we have really now mm -hmm, in, in mm -hmm. a couple places, a couple thousand places around the country, been evaluated by Manpower Demonstration Research Corporation, and it you makes you know that's music to my ears. Yes, yes, I know. That's why I said it to you in particular. Uh, but you know that work, and and uh, a, a young person in an inner city school, especially these young men who are dropping up because they, in some part, because they see no future. Um, if they see something tangible right in front of them where they can uh, start uh, work while they're going to school in an area that, that proceeds into a career where they can get a good job or, or also encourages them, uh, if their academics uh, work out, to go to community college, to go on to college, not, not a tracking. But for things like construction, for things like high tech uh, technology, uh, travel and entertainment, uh, there there are a whole series of areas, uh, healthcare, where where uh, we project that we will have jobs for the future, uh, and uh, where the young people, if they see that well, they're in high school. I think we can hold a lot of them in high school, and they'll go on mm -hmm. to jobs, and, and they won't become disconnected. Seeing is a big word. Um, I remember the research of William Julius Wilson, a um, sociologist at Harvard now, uh, where he identified the absence of referral networks and so forth, particularly for inner city blacks in Chicago where he did his research. Um, and he attributed uh, many of the problems um, in finding a job to the fact that there weren't these networks. So there are networks for Mexican Americans for certain kinds of yes. jobs. Those of us who live in Washington, networks for Pakistanis to become uh, taxi drivers. I mean, you name your specialty. Yes, that's right. yeah. And there aren't. So we have to create them, and, and uh, the place, uh, a major place to do it is through the, the school mm -hmm, system, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, where the, the, the place where the young person sees that network in the school is, is, I think the major insight of workforce development for the 21st century is for people to be able to earn and learn at the same time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so in the high school, uh, spending part of the day, we started to do that. Uh, uh, during the Clinton administration, but we stopped. We had a school-to-work program, went through a planning phase, and then we dropped it. Uh, and we have an old idea called cooperative education that's really always been underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. uh, if young people could uh, have part of the day in school and part of the day uh, in the workplace uh, in an area that's going to become a career so that it's meaningful and it can lead to a good job, I think that's a major, it's not the only strategy, but I think it's a major thing that we should be doing in, to a much greater degree than we are now. And, and you know, I think there's broad agreement ab about that as the model. And I just wonder whether we lack not just the political will, but the knowledge of how to make a program like that work on a nationwide basis. I mean, many of the programs that you described um, I just had difficulty getting off the ground. And we're not talking here about whether the program is a good idea or not, but that we just don't seem to know how to move schools to do things. Oh, I think it's happening. Uh, I think the harder thing is once young people become disconnected, and, and uh, we have some wonderful models like Youth Build, where young people learn mm -hmm. construction skills, and also it's about it's a double entendre, if you will, a little pun uh, that, that, that builds their own character. and. Uh, the returns and there's been evaluation on the service and conservation corps where young people go out and, and, and uh, do various things in the community, many of them related to uh, uh, green kinds of, of well, things. Let me push you here. Um, you know, I've been to some of these classrooms and um, the, what we used to call the voc ed teacher, the yes. shop teacher is, you know, not the most energetic person in the world. And he or she is often teaching technology of a decade or two before. It, it does seem as if, for all the model programs, the basic school system, 
uh, is doing less today to show alternative career paths for young people than in the past. Yes, I, I would dispute that. It's certainly true that this is a struggle, that old-time vocational education, which involved tracking and, and essentially uh, was for kids that we didn't care about uh, and was uh, disproportionately minority, those same young people that we're talking about, uh, is, uh, still exists. We haven't, we haven't gotten rid of it. Uh, but we know a lot more about mm -hmm, how to mm -hmm. do it. Uh, we have career and technical education models now that work. And, and indeed, we, we have career academies or high-tech highs or, or uh, various terms are used around the country uh, in, in literally uh, hundreds of places, uh, thousands, small thousands of, of schools. So I think the momentum is there to do it right if we have the kind of uh, push from national leadership, push from school superintendents. My son in Chicago is in charge of the new and innovative is schools right? there. And yes, and, and he's working on getting these kinds of schools up and going in Chicago. And of course, our, our new Secretary of Education in the from country is, is my son Josh's boss, uh, Arnie Duncan. Well, now, speaking as a parent, does this mean that you'll have a son in town? I'd lo love to think so, but Josh isn't done with his work in Chicago, mm -hmm. and, and uh, he's very committed to that. Yeah. Well, you bring up education, and uh, you've been involved in some of these education arguments. Now, um, the new education secretary is famous for having his feet in both camps. Yes. Of, um, I don't know whether they're called uh, Fix the Schools First uh, or, or the group that says, well, uh, you have to do other things as well. I'm going to let you describe the argument, if it is an argument, and what you make of it. Well, I don't think there's a real argument between people who say that we, we have to fix the schools uh, and people who say we have to both fix the schools and deal with poverty and, and, and deal with family circumstances and deal with other aspects of the children's lives. Um, if you talk to the fix the schools people, they, uh -huh. they, they admit that it's a larger picture. And it, so it, it, uh, to me, uh, it's a kind of a phony argument. Now, there's a real argument between people who are standards-based uh, strongly within the school system uh, and people who emphasize choice much more, including vouchers. Mm -hmm. I think that's a real uh, uh, fault line. And uh, Arnie Duncan has been somebody who uh, I, I don't think he's probably pro-voucher. Uh, in any case, he's been the uh, school superintendent, so his job is the public schools. But he's done a wonderful job of both promoting choice within that school system in Chicago, all different kinds of, of magnet schools and themed schools mm -hmm. and uh, all of those. And, and even the charter schools in Chicago are actually uh, uh, within the, the umbrella of the school system, which is not mm -hmm. true everywhere, mm -hmm. and being very committed to, to high standards uh, for every young person, but putting the resources there to be with the high standards, dealing with the question of how do you get the best teachers to go into places where they're greatly needed. And so I think he's a great choice, uh, to use that word again, but uh, in this time very enthusiastically, great choice for Secretary of Education because he does have a foot in both camps and one should have a foot in both camps. When he comes to Washington, his first project will be No Child Left Behind. Um, what's your take on that legislation and where do you think it should go? Oh, uh, oh have, know, have we got I, five I, hours? Have we got five days? And, and, and you should feel free to say something about the origins of the name of the bill as well. Well, uh, of course, in our house, my wife, uh, as you know, your viewers may not all know, uh, runs the Children's Defense Fund, uh, and their uh, copyrighted, trademarked, uh, trademarked uh, slogan is Leave No Child Behind. So uh, shall we say she was more than a little perturbed when... Uh, those words appeared in a slightly different uh, order in the phrase, but uh, clearly taken from there. Uh, I think what we need is, uh, number one, uh, some uh, increase, some considerable increase in federal resources going to, to uh, uh, K-12 education, and we need to go expand down to pre-K, and we need to expand up to strengthening uh, uh, post-secondary education, especially community colleges. And within the schools themselves, I think we need to pay 
uh, a lot more uh, attention to uh, the, the whole question of multiple sources of teachers but high standards for them and, and uh, trying to make sure that we have principles, better principles, the best principles that we can have. I think smaller schools are a good idea, longer school hours. Uh, so that we maybe we've become a little fixated on the, on the tests. I think high stakes tests are a good idea, uh, but maybe we teach a little bit too much to the tests and we, we leave out some other things that are part of the enrichment that a, that a child ought to have. So it's a very complicated set of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I sometimes think we need to get a little less PC. Let me push this just mm -hmm. a bit. Mm -hmm. In the classes I've been in, and um, in the work I've done and in the work you've done. It's the boys who are in bigger trouble than the girls. And I don't mean to minimize mm. the issues that yeah. face uh, girls in our society. And these are low-income boys, uh, often from uh, families that have their own problems. And as you said, you know, we're in a predominantly white country, so the numbers are very, a lot of white boys who are in trouble, but as a percentage of the populations and so forth, very heavily African-American. I don't see anything in these test conversations, these choice conversations, except for all boys' schools or all girls' schools. I don't see anything about these boys have special needs. They need our greater attention somehow, and, and I don't think it's phonics or whatever. There's something else that we will be doing. Uh, insofar as there are two camps, uh, I'm certainly in the camp that says we need to fix our schools for sure and, uh, and without going back through that uh, sure, but sure. all the ways that are needed and we have to deal with the larger picture that, that, that these young people uh, present. Now some of the reason why we're seeing uh, some change in, in these uh, kind of gender performances which as you say cut across racial lines is a little bit mysterious. Um, We've certainly had wonderful... I think we men are just obsolete for the 21st century. Well, there you go. The Maybe that's the, the enough said. Uh, but but it, it may have something to do, actually, with how well women have done. They've done very well, and, and uh, you know, men have had it all to themselves for centuries, and some, some people may be having some trouble with that. Um, but I, I think that the, the basic point, especially for... for um, lower income children and, and, and children of color is uh, we, we need to be talking from the time they come on this earth. And it's not just about public policy. It's not just about putting money into things. It's also a civic responsibility. We should be figuring out how do we encourage all parents to read to their children, for example. Uh, we should be talking about uh, the fact that there's too much violence in the home. And, and uh, mm -hmm. as you say, uh, we, we, should, we need to be honest uh, about that. Uh, that, that the ways in which uh, children are being disciplined uh, are, are unfortunately uh, maybe making some, uh, having some effect that's, that's negative for the longer term. Uh, everything that's uh, needed in getting a child to school ready to learn. Uh, and then as they go through school, it isn't just what goes on during the school day, it's also at what goes on after school, the off school hours is very, very important. Uh, what goes on in the larger neighborhood and the larger community is very mm -hmm. important. And then pretty soon we get to a point uh, in high school where some of them should be in straight academic programs, but some of them, if we're going to hold on to them, need to see the economic payoff for staying in school. So it's a multiple set of things and, and uh, with a particular need for people to volunteer, to be mentors, to be tutors. Uh, th this is a wall-to-wall -wall set of responsibilities for our society. Which we've never done very well. And that's what worries me. And before we close, I'm going to ask you to help us think this through a little bit. You're more on the optimistic side of these discussions, which I think is great. Uh, and I maybe I'm more on the pessimistic side, but I, I see a world in which it really is the case that Federal Express delivers better than the post office for loads of reasons. And I look at how much has to be done. You've described it, mm -hmm. cradle to, you know, mm -hmm. and we haven't talked about the elderly, but this is really well, cradle, cradle to, to grade. adulthood yeah. anyway. Uh, and I wonder whether our political system 
our governance system, and I teach in a school, this is a school of public policy. I don't know what, I don't know, it's not that I think not, I don't know whether we're up to it. We're at a transformational time. We have an opportunity that we have not had for a long time. Uh, for a variety of reasons, and, uh, and I mean this as a comment that cuts across party lines because as a Democrat, I don't think the Democratic Party has been so wonderful either over this period of time. Uh, but we, we have a, 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 a new president who I think deeply understands these issues. Uh, he's constrained uh, in many ways by the current recession, which has to be dealt with on behalf of all of our people. Uh, and by people who will not necessarily support, even within his own party, some of the things that he will try to do. But nonetheless, it's new leadership. Look at the people that he's bringing into this government. This, this is a time when it's reasonable um, to be uh, optimistic about, about our future. Uh, we've had an instance of democracy with a small d here that's unprecedented. We have millions of people who are mobilized to want, uh, truly want change. That's not just a word and a slogan uh, because we know that there are changes of all kinds that are needed uh, and I really feel pretty good about where we're going to go once we get, p get past this awful recession. Well, I'm not going to ask you another question because that's a great way to end this show. Peter Edelman, thank you again for being with us. My pleasure. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.